Hey guys, what's up? It's JD Berthoom here. Um, today I'm going to give you a little insight, uh, kind of a tutorial, but kind of not a tutorial, on um, how I orchestrate some of my music. Um, this, excuse me, this particular cue um, is for a web series I am scoring called The Adventures of Iguana Man. It's actually quite funny, you should check it out. Um, um, anyway, so they're redoing um, uh, a lot of their older episodes uh, in order to make way for their uh, new season. Um, and so I, I was um, writing some music and uh, to accompany the ending credits, and it kind of has a, a couple of nice little melodies in there. So anyway, so mainly what I'm going to talk about today is the orchestration. I'm going to talk about um, kind of balance and what instruments I chose and how I tried to give the, the parts original and how I cheated a little bit um, uh, um, in regard to the fact that I, you know, this is for samples. This is not for a real orchestra and just something to be aware of, the differences between working with samples versus working with the orchestra. So I'm using Sibelius 7, and my sound set is um, a note performer, but um, the final piece I, I am mocked up with um, Cine Samples. So um, anyway, so first of all, I'll just start playing this. Um, the quality is going to not be absolutely amazing because it's coming out of my computer speakers and into the computer microphone, so I apologize for that, but just give you an idea. So the cue is fairly short. It's about 50 seconds long. Um, uh, so um, it's it's fairly straightforward, and that's one of the reasons why I chose it. Um, uh, so that way I can kind of explain everything that's going on and not make like a hours and hours of videos. <laughs> so because it's pretty um, uh, um uh, there's there's quite a bit um, going on. I tend to favor like in between. Um, in between, not not too busy. Like I like the busyness of like John Williams and his writing. But I also like straightforward um, writing that you know has a, has a has a theme and you can hear it clearly. Um, so I kind of pull from both of those. Like Koji Kanda, for example, he writes very simple tunes that are very memorable. So I try to kind of strike a note in between them. Um, anyway, so obviously this is a huge hit in the beginning. I mean, I can even get into talking about the voicing. Like for example, the the piccolo is on G. I believe is that G. Yeah, which is a very good note. It's actually the pretty much the highest really loud note it can play. I mean, it can play. Other notes, but it's just a nice note, so it's in G minor. So the flutes um, uh, play a unison and octave uh, below. Normally, you would have A2 here. You would write the text A2 um, to specify the fact that you want both flutes to play that note in unison. But I didn't worry about things like that besides, because it's not going to be for a real orchestra, so it's just it really is a waste of time. But um, uh, if, you're, if you're writing for a real orchestra, um, you want to do that. And you want to just keep that in mind when writing. Um, yeah. Um, oboes. Um, uh, um, are on this patch. I pretty much just had one oboe. Um, you don't really have oboes um, on. Uh, you don't really have oboes playing unison because they're slightly flat. They sound really terrible. Um, uh, so then the clarinets I have split in octaves. Uh, the reason is because the high ranges of the clarinets and the low ranges of the clarinets sound very very nice. Um, uh, the in between uh, the chalmo register, I think is what it's called, something like that. I probably totally mispronounced that, but that middle register, because the B-flat break is kind of dull, and ugh, so kind of, uh, so I'm trying to strike a note between the bassoons, octave, um, the horns carry the main triadic harmony, they carry this, and they have two-thirds in there, um, this is kind of a nice, a nice little voicing for them so they can play loud, um, uh, trumpets, uh, again, very nice, the G is very nice. So I have the fifth. The trombone is going to carry the fifth, and this D is very nice. Um, uh, I omit the tuba at the beginning because I didn't want to overdo the bass. Uh, because the center samples that I'm using, with my experience, um, the the sound is very bass heavy. Like the MGM scoring stage they recorded the samples at um, has a lot of bass in it. So I tend to be careful with not, you know, like oh, timpani, bass drum, contrabass, you know, cello. 
bassoons, tuba, bass trombone, like, boom, and it's like, it just kills everything. Um, so I, that was careful with that. And especially since, as you can see here, I, I have the timpanis um, uh, playing unison on itself an octave. Um, then just the cymbal, of course, and the snare drum has this really simple thing going, you know. Right. And so in this, um, uh, uh, it works fairly well, but, you know, of course, this would be like a, you know, there's kind of a, a hit and then forte piano building back up that doesn't play back quite as well in samples. So there's this kind of simple um, uh, thing going on. So first of all, the, the, the cellos and the basses are just kind of holding the rhythm, rhythm of the same cello. Okay, so they just play that. The violas have a little bit of a melody, kind of a film score as typical thing, starting at this, you know. Okay, so, um, so that's pretty straightforward, um, and that would be enough. But the clarinets add just another another bit of rhythmic vitality to it, um, and they kind of have this um, section here, so they play a sort of Danny Elfman type thing. And as you can see, I give them a little bit of rest um, uh, to to go from that note to that note. That's pretty. It's a it's a big jump. You wouldn't want to have like that, 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 that. You know, you want to kind of give them a little bit of space. So that's pretty simple. The timpani are just you know having the, playing a really simple thing. Um, then this sort of fanfare thing comes up. So the clarinets is kind of like E flat, D major, right? And the bassoons come in. I save the bassoons for the end. Um, uh, and the trumpets have this little fanfare. All right. Normally, I wouldn't write this for a B flat trumpet because this A right here, <coughs> excuse me, um, is fairly difficult. Actually, it's very difficult to play. <coughs> excuse me, within the B flat overtone series. So it'd be okay on a C trumpet. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> but um, uh, the only reason I'm writing it is because I'm a. Uh, um, uh, I know my samples can do it. So that's an example of something where <coughs> you'd have to take a lot more consideration. To, I just want power there. I know that Cinebrass can pull it off. So if I was writing this for a real orchestra, I would not give a high A to a B-flat trumpet. Uh, so the trombone is going... You know, so this kind of little thing happens. This nice thing here. Yeah. Combine with the bass instruments. Yeah. And then combine with the violin to counter melody. Which I probably could make louder, but you know, it's kind of this, you know. And then the snare drum. And then the timpani yeah, is pretty straightforward. Um, then this wind run uh, goes up to a head. Um, and this is where the melody comes in. So, um, so I'm using a, a sort of a Hollywood technique here to get a really huge sound. And what you do is you basically um, uh, give um, uh, you just want the melody to just explode in your face. So what you do is you write, you give um, uh, the melody in triple octaves um, to the first seconds of violas. Um, sometimes even the cellos, if you, if you if you have a lot of brass harmony chord going on, then you can do that to the cellos, but right now I'm just doing triple harmony. I get to I get to um, quadruple harmony uh, um, later. I mean quadruple octave. Um, it's not harmony. Um, so then you're playing unison melody, and then you also have a nice bass line, um, a nice bass line double with the uh, cellos and the basses. And then the trumpets and the trombones are playing the melody an octave apart, and the horns and clarinets are keeping the rhythm while the piccolos, flutes, and oboes do this stuff. Now this exact setup is used so commonly in colorful orchestral scores um, of the, both the golden age of film music and John Williams score, it's just so common, it's ridiculous. Like, you, just you know, be aware of these types of setups. So this is kind of the uh, a, a setup. So again, the clarinets and horns are on harmony. Um, uh, so um, the winds play runs and counter melodies. Um, usually just runs because it's hard to hear anything above that. Um, the trumpets and trombones. Uh, play the melody along with um, double. That's the main thing about this technique is that it's just 
you really can hear the melody, and you also can really hear the bass line. Um, so the, the harmony is there, it, it tells you what the chord is, and makes it pretty full, and blends well, since it's the horns, blend very well, but it, it, it always leaves room, and the clarinets also blend very well, so they put the two best blenders together, which is kind of a good technique. Um, so basically we have this melody here, so I'll, I'll play the melody sort of by itself. <laughs> So um, so that's kind of the that's kind of the melody. It's um uh, it's pretty decent. I, it gets stuck in my head. I, I kind of like it a little bit. But um uh, the ending uh, is a pretty typical you know bum ba ba bum boom. Yeah, it's kind of a typical swashbuckling ending. But um uh, all right, so this is what the melody sounds like, and then remember we're doubling it with with all these with all this doubling happening. This is what it sounds like. It's pretty big. <laughs> reason that the harmony came in is I, I switch off, okay? So I, so we have this first, you know, I don't want it to be just like this, just melody, the same thing th uh, through. So what I do is I change the texture. I don't want to add any counter melody to this track from the harmony. Um, actually, I do, <laughs> but it's quiet because it's a uh, piccolo. So, um, uh, but basically what happens is the horns start out playing this um, uh, harmony, harmonic accompaniment, and then they switch to the melody. So that's pretty high for a horn, but really good players could do it. Um, but, but again, this is an example of something where I know my samples can do it, but I normally would not write that. That's not safe to write um, uh, for something like a film, for something like a film score, unless it's you know a really important part and you're really confident about it and you know the horn players and yada yada yada. So anyway, so they 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 trade off with the um, the trombones, as you can see. So, and then the clarinets kind of have the same sort of, uh, it gives it a sense of continuity. They have the same thing that they had earlier. Um, it's kind of Danny Elfman thing. So they have that thing. All right. And then there's this wind melody that happens. Right, so and uh, the this counter melody blends into the real melody. If you notice very closely, it starts out kind of doing its own thing, but later it kind of turns into the melody. So, right, and then the piccolo just goes into the melody. Um, the flutes split into this um, uh, um, uh, thing, and the oboes are not playing unison. Um, here, there's just one oboe, and then the second oboe in comes for that. But normally, I would mark that because you just never want oboes playing in unison. Um, and normally, I, I think I added a glockenspiel doubling this because even, I mean, this is just a balance issue. Like I probably could have scored this slightly better. Just, I mean, you can hear it, but this wind, these winds are just so difficult to hear. <laughs> So that's why a, a, a um, Glockenspiel would be would be would be very nice. In fact, I think I'm gonna go ahead and add a Glockenspiel now, because I did I did in the later score. Um, so let's see, real quick, we'll add the Glockenspiel so just for that first line. Okay, so let's try that. So it kind of gives it, it, it gives it a sort of color that maybe is a little bit too happy, you know, or cheesy, but I, but I like it. And it, it allows you to hear it. It sounds, you know, very sweeping. So that's pretty much all that's happening in this part. Um, uh, oh, and also the bass line. I, I really tried to write a decent bass line here. I always try to write good bass lines, but that's one of the things I like about this particular scoring technique is that it leaves room for a really good bass line. <laughs> Pretty, pretty decent thing. 
Okay, so then after this, um, uh, basically the whole texture changes completely. It changes. It's it's similar, um, but it changes. Um, so the timpani gives the little boom, 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 you know. Right, and then the cymbal hits it again. You know. Um, uh, so now we have double octaves, not triple, but double. But we've, but, we've, but we've made up for that by the fact that now we have horns, trumpets, and trombones playing it. The melody. And they turn into harmony later, so it just gets really huge and really epic. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah. And I actually wanted more melody and less harmony even after this point. And, and, and if you think about it, it actually works because since... Um, uh, since I've given the harmony to the, the violins, the violas and the cellos, um, even the violas and cellos are not, like, worth, like, a single trumpet section. So I think it's kind of, since there's more brass and the harmony, instead of going, the harmony went from the brass to the strings, which means you get more melody because the brass are naturally more, more, um, are louder than the, a lot of the strings. Um, so yeah, and then I have these sort of arpeggios here, and these arpeggios are very well suited to stringed instruments um, because um, uh, they're on fifths and sixths um, which is great because it fits very well in the fingerboard of um, uh, pretty much any string in instrument except for the uh, except for the contrabass. Um, it'd be a little bit more difficult for the contrabass but, but they could do it. A good contrabass player could do it. So, so you have this Right, you know, bum, bum. and they kind of go into this Debussy sound, um, which again they get slightly quieter. But as long as you um, um, leave it there, as long as you have something high um, unison, like a, a good strong violin in one section playing a high note, that Debussy usually sounds fairly good, um, and it's not too quiet. Especially since we have all this other harmony happening, I just really wanted it to sound thick. Um, but um, anyway, this is very high. The violins definitely can play that, but it's very high. Um, and it's very stepwise, as you can see. Except right there, boom. If you, if you hear them play live, it's going to be boom. They're going to slide up to it. Um, so, and if this wasn't, this is very shaky. I mean, it'll work. Because it's stepwise, you can't have a lot of jumps when you're up high because they can't, they can, they're only on one string. They're on the high, um, uh, A string in this case. Um, yeah, no, E string. High E string. Um, but... Um, but it's just high enough that it's not ridiculous, um, uh, but because of the stepwise motion, um, and because of the fact that when you do have jumps, it, it's, it's slower, um, they, a good orchestra could pull it off. And I'm just doing it because it's just this huge, high, really piercing sound. Um, so, and again, the, the, um, uh, the trumpets and, you know, trombones, uh, um, go into, um, uh, they uh, go into harmony, but also, as you can see, I've separated the rhythm out from the trombone, so you can hear them separately. There's kind of this contrapuntal thing that's happening, so you get, there's kind of a brass, like a thickness bomb, but it's not just like ba, ba, they're not hitting the same thing. Just kind of a nice little thing. Right, the clarinets are doubling on octaves, that melody. Just to give it even more power, so it's just all right, so this this wind run is incredibly difficult. Um, uh, again, good players can do it, but it's very difficult. I, this is one of those things where I know my samples can do it, but I would I would not write something like this unless a really good orchestra was playing it. So. All right. So yeah, so that is very difficult. All right, and the timpani has a fanfare like a bum 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 bum. octaves and I'm, I'm using more timpani than I normally would like normally you wouldn't have timpani octaves like this because of the tuning but again I know that my samples can pull it off so I can do it just because I want that huge I want that huge sound so I'm cheating a little bit and I'm okay with that as long as you know what you're cheating and uh, you know how to write for a real orchestra if you did then you know um, I still try to I, I, I don't do it just because out of, out of laziness I always try to do it if there's a specific reason like the reason I've done these things the reason I did the high strings the reason I did that high trumpet A note, and the reason I'm doing this timpani is because I want power. I want a lot of power. Um, so if you're just if you're just writing stuff, you know, whatever sounds good, and you have and you don't and you don't know that what you're writing would not be very playable on the real instrument, then that's a bad thing. Um, so anyway, so um, yeah, so you kind of have this thing.
that bass line so I doubled it with the bassoon so let me give you more power and then held the bassoon note to give it some some thickness but also kept the movement going with the with cellos um, so that's pretty much it for that so you, you, you I think I went over every part of that texture um, and then of course the tuba plays a low G this is a very nice note that's just right it's low enough to be epic but not it's it's high enough to to be really screamable. Um, there would normally be breathing room here. Um, that's just assumed. I don't. I, you could write a rest, and I probably would like um, tie it. I would I would write this if it was for real orchestra, just so they would know to breathe there. But again, it's for samples, so I I, I, I won't worry about it. I kind of when I performed it, and I I put breath, breathing breathing in there. But uh, yeah, that's very important. <clears throat> So there's kind of this nice little, you know, horn thing, right, and, and kind of this harmony here. Again, a little counterpoint there. Um, and then this nice little wind run that just kind of, uh, it's like, ah, oh, we're calming down. So it's kind of like a repose, and then it builds back up. So the repose can't be very long because we only have 50 seconds um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to complete this piece of music, but I just kind of wanted to kind of let it release and then kind of build back up again to the ending, rather than just being insane the whole time and just wearing your ears out. So just kind of this, and then it kind of slows down, um, and the cymbal just kind of blends everything together. And then uh, we're on pits now. The bass are playing pits, which just gives a nice light sound. All right, um, and normally you wouldn't pits would be too quiet for anything, but as long as you don't have uh, a lot of low stuff going, it, it just gives it a very light texture. Um, but the cellos and the basses, since their bodies are so much larger than the violas and the violins, um, uh, their pizzicato tends to project very well. So, um, and then we kind of have this typical oboe thing. Um, you know, bum, bada, dum, bum, bada, bum, bum, bada, bum, 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 It's kind of the opposite. I like doing it. It's like the opposite. I think John Williams has used it before, but it's like the opposite of, you know, it's bum, bum, bum. It's, bada, bada, bada. it's kind of the, the opposite. It's going down to the bottom. And then I dovetail into the uh, clarinets. So to both give breathing room and change up the texture. Right, so nice little fanfare stuff. Right, um, uh, so we start off with the horns, and then the trumpets come in later. Because I want to give the trumpets a break, because I've really been asking them to do a lot. Like this, that's a B flat. You know, I, I kind of want to give them just a second to not murder their lips. Um, so... <laughs> This harmony again, really, really massive, you know, and then there's just kind of this nice bass line. And bum, 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 which they all do. And I, as you can see, the, the double bass goes below its range because I'm assuming you have a C extension. I, I really just, I love having the cellos and basses um, uh, double each other, and cello can go down to a C, and uh, a contrabass can only down, go down to an E an octave below. So if you add the C extension, it can go down that low. Um, again, um, not all of them have a C extension, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure how difficult it is to play. Um, but I just generally stay away from it if I'm writing for a real ensemble. But again, if you want that huge sound and you just need that low, those low notes, um, uh, I mean, you you could do, you know, you could do this, you know. But it just wouldn't it wouldn't be the same. It just doesn't have that hugeness. Um uh, yeah, and then there's this there's a bunch of counter melody stuff going on. Um uh, the melody trades off a lot with the violins, one, two, and the violas, as you can see. Okay. So what's happening basically here is there's kind of this counter melody. And then it goes, yeah. 
So this kind of this nice counter melody. Uh, the violins one um, uh, and the violas kind of do with the melody what the trombones and horns were doing with the harmony at the beginning. They're trading it off. Uh, the violin is to start with the uh, melody, and then it kind of they they go down to this. They go to chords, and the reason it doesn't go no 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 because it'd be hard for them to jump. So I kind of gave them a nice uh, movement that works. So I'm gonna uh, give them a nice. Right, and the viol violas are opposite. They start. So so. So um, uh, they kind of trade off. So you get it just gives this nice full contrapuntal sort of string sound. It's very lush. And then the and then the texture simplifies. And the reason I leave the violas out, it's almost like a fugal technique, is because I want there to be more power when they come in. Like dun 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 So just kind of add them in later. It just adds. You can hear it when they come in. And also, I want to give openness in this range for this, um, you know. Bum, 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 bum. So that's a third of the chord, and that's pretty low, so I don't want to muddy up this range. And this bass is so low that it's not going to muddy it up, but if I added anything in here, it's going to kind of muddy with this up. So I kind of gave room for this bum, 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 and then it goes back into it. Um, and of course, we have these wind runs. Um, uh, so the flutes kind of pick it up here, and then the piccolo picks it up a second later, you know. So this kind of thing here. Um, two things I did with ranges, um, if you notice here. We have the piccolo, and then flutes an octave lower, and then an octave lower the oboes. But the oboes, they can't go, they can't keep going down because it's under their range. So I, I, you stop them here, and then you pick it up over here. Um, we're now on my doubling the flutes. And then instead of going up to the flutes range, they just go... Um, uh, they just go down, kind of pick it up an octave, and it works. It doesn't... it, it makes sense. It just sounds like a patriotic little ditty. <laughs> so the one section is this. Right. The brass section is very straightforward, playing the melody, um, splitting into chords. Right, and then the timpani's going, the typical, the typical fanfare thing, and of course the suspended cymbal. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, and I explained the strings, so, so yeah, so it's a fairly, this is probably the most complex texture in the piece, honestly. So, but it works. And then, and then the next year gets really simple, because I really want them to focus on the melody. So, um, uh, it's literally, uh, there aren't even, uh, so the melody automatically ha haws. No, the melody um, automatically has a lot of uh, thirds, just the way that it, I've written it. Um, so I gave, I didn't really care about harmony that much because the bass have, they have the, they have the, t the root of the chord and the fifth of the chord. So I didn't worry too much about having those thirds in there because they already exist in the melody. So it's just, you know. <laughs> Save this quadruple um, uh, thing for the end. Okay, this G is the highest note possible on the violin. Besides harmonics, it is. This is ridiculous. There is there is no way with the jumps. There is absolutely no way that anyone would ever write that. Like that's pretty much impossible to play. Again, the only reason I'm doing this is for crazy power, and because it's not out of range. They can they can they can play it. It's just very 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 difficult that high because the board is so tiny. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd be surprised. Usually I underestimate the... It's always better to underestimate what they can do. But again, the, the only reason I'm doing this is because it, I know the samples can pull it off. So there's this huge quadruple octave sound. Um, uh, 
Um, this is pretty much the full tootie. I, I saved the full tootie for the end. Um, uh, so, yeah, so they're playing quadruple octaves. The contrabass is playing this gigantic thing um, uh, um, with, the, with the bass clarinet and the tuba. They're just whamming out this bass. <laughs> this nice thing right um so i first um i give the horns uh and trumpets trombones i give them this harmony so bum, bum, boom bum, 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 because i want that second one to be more powerful so i kind of make the first one a little bit muddier but then i really want the second one to be powerful so you can see i mean because of the because of how, how high my my i mean i accented everywhere if you pay really close attention i mean um where this note is located right here, that's very the center in the range of the contrabass. Um, they can just kill it. The cymbals, and then of course this you know, timpani, bam, 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 um, and then, um, and then the fact that all the brass go to unison on the melody. Um, it's just, and then the piccolo goes a lot higher to the piercing range. And basically, I I did every possible technique that I knew of making that as just. Huge as possible, like bum 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 bum. It's kind of this this discovery, you know, um, a little wind run building up to it. And then there's very simple. There's literally nothing happening. It's just this huge chord. Um, uh, I think these are all octaves. Yeah, and then all the chords are in the brass, which works very well because of overtones. I think um, I also only have uh, unison in the in the winds. Yeah, and then it goes into harmony later. Um, it just ends in the tonic chord. Um, and I think I don't know if this goes in harmony as well. I think it does. Uh, no, it just goes. Okay, yeah, we're good. All right. So bum da dum da bum da da bum da dum. And again, the snare drops out because I wanted to be this cohesive texture. And then the, the the feature here is the timpani because the only thing that's moving is the timpani. It's literally just going. So it's just it's literally just a timpani fanfare. So we'll start back from here. ending <laughs> bum, 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 bum. again I would make it longer but it's it's only 50 seconds um, it was actually supposed to be shorter than that I made it longer than I was supposed to but but yeah so there we go so listen to the whole piece um, again just kind of paying attention to um, what I talked about the different techniques that I used um, um, yeah so actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play you just the winds from the beginning just the there's just the brass and then just the 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 percussion and then just the the uh, the strings and show you what they're all doing, and uh, and then um, uh, I'm not gonna play you the entire thing beginning to finish but I'm gonna put the link in the description of the final thing with samples so you can hear how it how it sounds you know closer to how a real orchestra would play it so. <laughs> So that's the one section. Now we'll play the uh, brass section.
also like to point out that this high at C at the end is also really difficult, and I normally wouldn't ask him to do that. All right, so um, uh, well, well, I don't think Glock's been there, but we'll just you know here. <laughs> Pretty straightforward, simple, mostly color stuff. Um, and then we'll play the strings. So, there you go. Alright. So, ah, for the heck of it, I'll just play the whole thing. you enjoyed this video and maybe got a little bit of insight into how I orchestrate my pieces. Um, so yeah, check out the link in the description of the final piece of music mocked up. So um, thanks for watching. Um, you can look forward to new videos in the future. Tell me if you if you got anything out of this. Um, so thanks.